We're in. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We are live on the internet, broadcasting around the world. I am sure that there are millions and millions of people sitting on the edge of their seat, dying to hear what we've got to say. And today, it is the history of Surprise Stare Games in an act of incredible narcissism. Both Alan and Tony have asked me to rake over their histories and hopefully bring up some nuggets. So to begin, I'll just introduce our two guests, the founders and steerers of Surprise Stare Games. We have Mr. Alan Paul. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And we have Lady Honey Blunt. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Yes. So, so where I want to start is before Surprise Stare Games, before you two met each other, what is your history in gaming? How did you come through games into the hobby arena? What, what was the journey that brought you to the place where you might even consider designing games? We'll start with Alan. Yeah, because I'm the oldest. I'm the oldest. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I, I, um, well, my my history in gaming starts with family games at Christmas, and in the old days, that didn't be, involve any kind of computers or anything like that. It was all it was all analog, so it's all Waddington's. Well, am I allowed to say the M word, Monopoly? Or, I mean, without, or wishing to, without wishing to embarrass, <laughs> what kind of date are we talking here? Uh, Oh well, um, uh, well, I was I was born in 1957, um, and then the dinosaurs came, and then they all died out. Uh, no, well, so by the time I was about 11, so what is that, 68, something like that, I designed my first shambolic attempt at a game. Um, but the, the thing that the thing that's, that encouraged me to do it was a game called Formula One, which probably nobody's heard. It was an old Waddington's, I think it was. What yeah, racing game. game, racing game, where the great thing about that was, it wasn't just roll and move. It wasn't roll and move at all. You had you had a, a little um, a, a little uh, what do you call it? a monitor thing, a cardboard thingy, where you decide on what speed you were going to go, and that's the amount of spaces you moved around the track. And the inside track was shorter, as you'd expect. But you also had tire wear and brake wear gauges, and you could use your tire wear and brake wear to reduce your speed, so you could go around the corners. And the corners all had specific speeds that if you exceed them you have a chance of spinning off and you know bad things happening um so it had so quite sophisticated elements of how you might control your car but it also had a bunch of cards and the cards were all special things the one i most people remember if they played it is the one called superb driving so that allows you to go around the corner at any speed to kind of take that for formula one i can go around this 30 mile an hour corner at 160 and I'm so great I can do it and I thought well you know some of these mechanism mechanisms are are really really fun interesting things I thought I can probably do something like this in my in the arrogance of youth I thought wouldn't it be fun you to were do something 11 like and you were thinking thoughts like yeah. that I was thinking about yeah. why did pictures of ladies <laughs> make me feel funny downstairs and you were thinking about designing a motor yeah. game. The hell well, I was, with you? Hell, I was I was never cool, Tony. I was never one of the cool kids at all. I was, <laughs> I was, I was not being cool, I could tell you. <laughs> I was a spotty geek. Um so so you know, I I designed a game which was terrible, but I remember the really nice thing about it, it was in a I put it in a mirage a, a, a box of a of a of a mirage plane. That looked really cool. Because I did plastic modeling, as geeks did in those days. And that's still around in my archive. <laughs> I was going to say, Alan. All of us game designers got pictures of us, pictures of us when we were models. Yeah, when we were modelling. <laughs> exactly. We needed the money, Alan. We needed the money. He did that money. And, and so, was, have games? Did you ever go through? Often, you see the the evolution of a gamer is that they'll, you know, they'll be really into it when they're young, and then they'll have a fallow period where they think that they've got to assume the mantle of adulthood. Was that the case with you, or did you always play games constantly? Throughout your life, was it's that in tone? Oh me, okay. <laughs> I always talk to you. Sorry, right? I talk to me. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, I I always played. I was I was the one member of the family, and it was mainly family games. You see, who would always say at Christmas time, "Yeah, we need to get a game out." Or sometimes even even not at Christmas. It's ridiculous playing games not at Christmas. How mad! And we used to play. I was a war gamer as well. 
Um, I have, oh, you're I have, ticking all the boxes now. I have all you? the boxes. I have endless geek credentials. Yeah. So, and we used to, well, back in those days, you're talking late 60s, early 70s. If you're playing war games, there's no rules because there's, there's no, you can't just go to the internet and download a set of rules or anything. Um, so nobody had access to any rules. You could, you could, you could maybe, if you were lucky, find somewhere and they could mail order you something. They could post it to you. But, but since a lot of war gaming was done in America, that was pretty much inconceivable. So we had to invent our own rules. So we did. So we have you have handwritten little handwritten books of all the of all the rules that we would do, and the combat results tables all scrawled in pencil. And we we have so this that's how I got into that's how I got into it really. really yeah. Yeah, we have this picture of war gamers being a, a particular breed of person, you know, and you know, unhealthy, unhealthy yeah, yeah. with the firing mechanisms of Luger pistols and that sort of stuff. I mean, what was what was the war gaming community like when you were going through it in sort of late sixties, early seventies? I assume it was a pretty much middle aged male, not a lot of showering pursuit, right? <laughs> Well, that, well, uh, yeah. I mean, at, at, at that point, um, it was very small and and inbred, you know, <laughs> definitely. Um, uh, it was, it was, it was, yeah. It was fundamentally geeky people who who were, who liked to find out about the stats of tank armor, you know, and tank guns. It was all about that kind of thing. Um, no, but I, I mean, I I I was a I was mixing with the same kind of weird war gamer people. We we're all much. Of, Generally, we were much of the same age. The older people who were the kind of gurus mm. of, of war gaming we wouldn't fraternise with those because they were like miles above us. And besides, it, it, travel was more difficult. You know, I used to dream of going to the next village. No, um, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was a, it was a totally different time. That was the, uh, that was the totally your your landed gentry, and you were, uh, you know, you're a you're a rural rural individual. <laughs> When did gaming enter your life? Was it was it always a thing, uh -huh. or, or, or did it well, come to you later at college or something like that? But, no, it sort of it was there. I mean, I remember getting board games given to me at Christmas, um, which is obviously the traditional British time of, of dealing with board games. And I've had a couple of acquisitions recently for my <laughs> forthcoming board gaming museum date to be announced. And I look at it and go, "Hang on, I I'm pretty sure I had that game when I was about." eight or nine years old, you know, mid to mid to late seventies. So there were a lot around, but I don't remember actually playing them very much. And it was only really when I went to college and discovered D and D and then board gaming on the side. Uh, and then during my year out, when we were not role playing, we were board gaming. So risk diplomacy, blood Royale, and so on. So I really began to get into, into board games. And then we discovered uh, Shogun or uh, Samurai sword slash Ikuza. <coughs> and that was the game really that, that we adored as a group so we were either role playing on a sunday or we were playing yakuza on a wednesday into the evening and maybe if we were feeling particularly antsy with each other we'd have played a game of diplomacy just to really kick things off you know so, um, so and you oh, sorry carry on i was just gonna say that it, it was um samurai swords was the first game that we actually <coughs> decided to come up with our own rule there were some elements of the game where we thought because we played it so so many times two or three times a week for over a year that we thought, right, this bit of the ninja is wrong, and this location seems, to, this sea route seems to be a real bit wrong, and so we modified the rules to, to kind of tweak things up for us because we'd all played it so many times. So that was the first time I actually got into dabbling with, with rules. And so you know, you, you talk about role playing there, and you're about ten years younger than Alan, right? It's, uh, it's, so, he's following in my footsteps. You see, ten and, and years so, later. So what was the what was the first D and D. Are you a sort of classic red box? Red box. D &D? Yeah, I didn't play the red box with anybody at all. I just bought it and read it and loved it, and I and I did the natural thing, which is to sort of come up with my own tables of things. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to Polytechnic, that's when I met my mate Malcolm, and he loved D and D and had been doing D and D for a long. So he was GMing a long campaign, and we all joined in. And we used to go over to his place on a Thursday because we had no lectures on a Friday. So we would go there Thursday afternoon after lectures, buy the beers, and just basically spend that entire long weekend role playing, listening to War of the Worlds, smoking, drinking, falling asleep, having water pistol fights in the middle of the night, that kind of stuff. And really, really got into role playing that way. It was uh, fantastic. 
I mean, this is a question to both of you. How important do you think the RPGs, especially D and D, are to the current gaming world? Do you think it's it, do you think it's one of those fundamental pillars on which gaming is built? I think I think so. I mean, I, I uh, well, I, I was at college in seventy five, and shortly that we started at that at that stage doing D and D when it first came over to the UK. Um, the white box version, um, um, rather than the red box, but um, that was introduced to us by Lou Pulsifer, or I hmm. should say now, Doctor Lou Pulsifer. He was doing his PhD then. Um, I think he was <clears throat> one of these people who was supposed to be spending a couple of years in the UK doing a PhD and ended up spending five years or something. Hmm. Um, I hope I'm not maligning him. But he introduced us to D and D, and he played he played D and D with. Uh, some of the, you know, I'm not sure if he actually played with Gygax, but is, you know, th those kinds of people. So yeah. he learned it from from those, and he he introduced that to us. It's very tactical because because it, it was based on the old on wargaming on on chainmail and things like that. He introduced that to us, and we we, we played a very very tactical version of that. But it, yeah, that was certainly for us a quite a seminal experience in terms of oh wow, this is unusual. This isn't just you know, it's not a normal game. It's this is something revolutionary and radical. And of course, it because <laughs> I remember when we were first reading the rules, we were thinking, "You can't play this game; it's completely impossible. It doesn't make mm. any sense whatsoever." So basically, you had to make it up, which is which is great because it means you're automatically into that. Oh well, um, my thief wants to climb a wall. Let's. How do I know if I'm going to fall off? I, I look up the rule. There's nothing in there. There's not. A, so we have to make something up. So you're automatically having to make rules up. Um, or or just go free, you know, free Kriegspiel on it. Uh, but generally, you, you want to have some kind of framework, um, and the D, D rules are a very very loose framework. So you, that automatically stimulates you to, to actually look at gaming as something that you can create in, which is great. So I, I think that was that's how it was revolutionary and radical from my point of view. It also helped that Lou Pulsifer, who designed Britannia, mm. amongst other things. Um, uh, uh, was our uh, was our was our I was going to say mentor almost in a way. I mean, he because he taught us D and D, but he also uh, put me on the track of how I, I never realised you could actually get games published. You see, hmm. till I met till I met Lou, I actually met because I met somebody who actually had stuff published. And I was, wow, wow, you can actually. Well, in my naivety, I thought you can make money out of this. Um, that's not true, not even now. But <laughs> uh, theoretically, you can make money out of it, um, and that put me on that track. So, so, yeah, I think D&D was re 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 RPGs are ra radical. So, so you've both talked about Alan is precocious and designing Formula One games at the age of three or whatever. Tony, <laughs> you're, you're rejigging Samurai. Do you think that both of you are... Because, because I sort of flirted with the hobby game world since I was a kid, and it, but it's only sort of in the last... I guess eight years that I really dived into it, and the the idea of having my name on a game box is very appealing. But <clears throat> I, I can't imagine where to start. My brain doesn't work in that way. I mean, I'm quite creative, but not in that way. Do you think you both had a a natural aptitude to think in these sort of systematic ways, Tony? Did it did, does it no, come naturally I, to you? I think. I, I was always very creative. I, lo I love writing, and I always loved writing, and I've got some very weird mm. little stories I wrote at <clears throat> primary school. My headmaster was really good at primary school. He said, if you want to write a story, give me a chapter breakdown and a, and a quick summary of the story, and I'll give you all the paper, and then we'll, you can draw a picture for the cover, and you can, we'll hang it on the wall, and all the other kids can read the story. And when I started at that school, there were maybe two stories on hanging from the, the pegs that other children had written. And I very quickly took over the entire <laughs> shelving with with my little books hanging there was there were talk of the otter type stories there were action adventure alistair mclean type stories all in about 25 pages but i made it from a beginning to a middle to an end mm. yeah. and it was yeah. my headmaster's bless him encouragement of that creativity i've always loved writing and even when i did i was going to do a journalism degree that was my original idea but i failed all my a levels didn't get the right grades so I ended up just sort of knocking in onto a computer course on clearing, which is, you know, the sweeping up of all the spare spaces mm. and um, really enjoyed it. But I was cartooning and I was writing all the way through all of that. So, um, yeah, I think my, from my perspective, it comes from the 
it's just a creative thing. And what I found with board games, especially when I started playing Magic the Gathering, was how I could express my creative <clears throat> storytelling side in a different medium that wasn't just a picture or a block of text. There was another way of expressing those feelings. So the Black Overcoat game became something that was born in that early fecund period. Um, Bloody Legacy started out as a game called Food Fight because we had such terrible food in the canteen where I worked that we used to take the mick out of it. And I, I made this game up. Copper Twaddle just came out as a morning, Mornington Crescent type moment where I thought I want to make a game where you just pretend you know what you're doing on the board with, with fancy pictured cards. And then there's a game called Ecology about clearing up the planet and putting the animals mm. back into their homes. And that became Eye of the Engine, ultimately, the whole thing behind that. So really, for me, it was more a drive to be creative. And then board games, and it was particularly when I met Alan, when we were playing Magic the Gathering together, that I realized there was a lot more out there than just Magic the Gathering and Monopoly and Cluedo and a couple of things that you might see in Toys R Us and plus Risk and all the things I'd seen before. Alan had Euro games. I'd, I'd never heard of these things before. And yeah. Shoko mm -hmm. and Co was the first Euro game I actually played a proper game. And he brought it over to the house and we played it. And it's like, this is yeah. great. It, it's interesting that you mentioned clearing because <laughs> I oh, there is a link. By the way, before there we carry link. on before we get I, I had an unconditional offer to drama school so oh, I don't need to oh, I don't need to associate okay. with this riffraff yeah, yeah, yeah. honestly oh I I, well, no, I know I, my place I <laughs> well I it's quite possible did you come did you go through PCAS for clearing polytechnic yeah yeah because yeah, 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 yeah. I wrote I wrote the manual I wrote the See, manual I, literally Alan I, Alan forged <laughs> me in the hot flames of because <laughs> it, 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 when Tony says writing, Tony was doing creative writing, and I, I and when I was well, I, when I left um, when I left, left university, I, I was I was I was doing educational admin, which was uh, it was actually not a career choice. It's sexier it was, than you think, Ben. No, it's not. <laughs> well, uh, to be fair, to be fair, my first office was all women, but that's. A different story. Wrong with that. <laughs> it's the twenty first century, Alan. Hey, there was no internet. There was no camera phones at that time. Uh, exactly, no exactly. evidence. Um, but so, so yeah. So I mean, I, I ended up working for for the Polytechnic Central Admission System (PCAS) and um, as publications officer, which which had a very loose job description, which basically, if it's got print on it, Alan's responsible for it. So since we had printed envelopes, I had on print. I was responsible for buying envelopes as well as. Uh, writing when I, and I wrote the guide for applicants of ECAS. When I say wrote, because we didn't have much number of computers, I actually literally hand wrote the whole of the guide for applicants by hand. So, all those university ent all those polytechnic entries that you saw, I had handwritten them all. Damn it. Um, and uh, yeah, hello to people out there. I'm, I'm wait, I'm saying hello to Doug, Doug and Shelley Great. in the States. <laughs> Doug and Shelley Garrett, you know, Yay. Yay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. second best podcast on second, campaign. second best. I did say second best. Good. I did say. So while I was doing <laughs> while I was doing the clearing, I actually also dabbled in writing some short stories. Yeah. So I dabbled in creative writing, and I decided I could either go down that creative writing route, or I could design games. And there was no real contest. So I decided to go down the designing games and not make any money you know that was the basic choice so, so this is a this is a <clears throat> this is a bit of a digression but i think i think it's interesting and I, I might regret getting tony on this kind of subject but you know you're both parents you've both you've both been through school systems and had children who've gone through school systems and i think it started with my generation at school that there was there was a very great focus on your education is about providing grist to the industrial mill. You're not supposed to be creative. You're not supposed to think. You're supposed to just get qualifications and get a job. Yep. Do you think that that trend, firstly, is that trend still ongoing? And secondly, do you think we have done a disservice to our children making education solely about that because when i hear stories of a headmaster encouraging you to write novellas in primary school it seems to me that that is fundamental in not just making a consumer and a worker be but also someone who can contribute to the whether that be micro or macro <laughs> environment in which they live absolutely i, I mean i i've i've worked as i've worked in education on 
admin mainly in in, in bureaucratic organizations and it's 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 all based on on qualifications and and it's just it's nuts i mean I, I suppose i can say that in a position of privilege in that i have got a good degree i've already been through the mill i've got all the credentials but it's it's the fact that everything is about qualifications and that children school children and young adults are put through this that you know you've got to have qualifications to make something of yourself that's the be all yeah, and end of lie and it's, it is, it's, it's an enormous lie yeah, yeah ab true. absolutely. I mean, I don't remember any any particular pressure. I mean, people were saying, like, you know, I know my dad wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, mm -hmm. because he's an aspirational person. And he wanted his son to do aspirational things. I just wanted to go to college because I'd heard it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And so even when I couldn't get into the course I wanted, I still wanted to go to college. Mm -hmm. And the government was kind enough to pay you some money at that point. So, that, so you didn't have to run up a huge debt. And there was a real feeling and we're talking to early to mid 80s now that when you got to that level of education you were allowed to enjoy yourself for the first year the whole point of university and polytechnic was to learn something about yourself as well as about the things that you were doing so if you chose a subject of computing the first year wasn't very difficult it was just going to sort out the wasters from the people who, who had some application mm. to, to do the work but it was about learning to be who you are and survive by yourself and cook for yourself yeah. and socialize and all that kind of stuff now that kind of stuff is 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 pushed to one side and that the idea that you could go to college now and spend your first year joining role playing clubs or doing sports seems a bit odd because you you you're you're spending an awful lot of money that you you in mm. theory got to pay back at some point and why would you fritter it away doing nothing when you should be doing something to get a good result at the end of it so it is unfair pressure it's unfair pressure on children in in school in the earlier schools and it's unfair pressure to be there in the, I mean, I, I know several friends whose children are now back at university and they're paying thousands and thousands of pounds for student accommodation, but they're sitting in their accommodation doing Zoom lectures. Mm -hmm. right. And they could have done that from home and they wouldn't have to have spent four grand on accommodation for the winter term. So regardless of the situation we find ourselves in, there are plenty of people who enjoy taking the money off them still. So not only are they losing the money, they're losing the money in an environment where they're worried about becoming sick. They can't see their friends and family very easily. And they're not even getting the best possible education that could be delivered by, the, by their establishments. So aside from COVID, I still think, I agree with Alan, it's just not a, it's not a very playful environment. You know, it is about, you know, get in there, get the qualifications, get out there, get a decent job, earn the money, contribute to the tax system, fit in your yeah, I think education is very, very, very important. I mean, I think, I think it's 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 some of this most important thing that that young people and old people can can have is having an education. Learning how to learn is absolutely vital. the The fact that that is converted large, largely by successive governments into you must get the piece of paper that says you can do X. That's the real difficulty. Um, and and that that's that's really quite that's quite sad because we we you lose the purpose. If the purpose isn't to get the qualification, the purpose is to learn how to learn, know how to do things, gain life experience. Um, and okay, yes, if if you're a medical doctor, I think it's quite important that that you do actually have the qualification as well. Obviously, I mean there are certain See, I learned. See, where you need to have the qualification, which, yeah. which actually does state that you are good at this yes, thing you don't have to be a puritan to do that there are plenty of people who are who who spent the first year of, of medical college stealing body parts and leaving them in bars and stuff and messing about and getting pissed because that's part of growing up as part of doing what you do i spent 50 quid in 1986 on an electronic drum synthesizer and an amplifier to go with it i neither played the drums nor did i have 50 pounds to spend on this stuff you know, that point, I got £700 grant. So £50 is one fourteenth of my allowance for the entire term. And I spent it on a drum synthesizer. Now, I learned a lot about myself the following year when my bank restricted me to 35 <laughs> quid a week. And I had to pay my rent and get my food and pay my bus pass out of that 35 quid. So, you know, I learned my lesson. And I, I've I never played a, the drum since. I think, it's a, I think it's fatal to rob children of the chance to experience their youth right 
I mean, I think you're in an ideal opportunity. You're young, you're stupid, you want to spend all the money, you want to drink all the alcohol, and you want to just, you want stories to tell when, you know, the anxiety of your oncoming death is forever present. You want to have a place that you can retreat to where you just didn't care. And I think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a tragedy that you, the children today are being robbed. And this is why you see, I, I've got to that age now where I can talk about generations beneath me, and they all seem frightfully serious. And I, I think that's, I think that's an issue. Anyway, away from the politics. So, you <laughs> know, you started it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. So you've got Alan, and he's you know designing war games, working in the war gaming community. You've got Tony, uh, you playing role playing games, buying drum synthesizers, having <laughs> having a ponytail. In fact, yeah. wow. Yeah. So how important? How <laughs> fundamental? How seminal in your lives is Magic the Gathering? Oh. Oh, the MTG. Oh, dear. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's very, very important for me. I mean, I wouldn't have met Alan without it. I wouldn't have met Mark Stanfield, a mutual friend of ours, without playing Magic. I wouldn't have met a great many fantastic people in the, in the subsequent sort of six or seven years where I was playing it seriously had I not um, played that game. I wouldn't have worked out I could do a board game version of my Black Overcoat cartoon instead of a weird action point, multi-million chip nonsense thing. It introduced me to effectively multi-use card mechanisms in a very simplistic way, but in, into probability, into presentation, into combinations, firing combinations off of, of, of effects between cards and within decks and across decks. And it's absolutely fundamental to it, to, to, to who I am as a, as a gamer. It's incredibly important. Alan? Uh, not so much, not so much. I mean, I, I, I did get quite addicted to it i think i think tony and i both did and we and, we, and it, it was an interesting experience and and it was i think it was actually um quite instrumental in 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 making communities out of people because we used to go to cricklade uh, near swindon on the regular the regular run down there and it was the same kind of people we would meet up and we'd have we'd chat and and we'd, and we'd play magic the gathering and commiserate or celebrate as appropriate um I think in terms of the game, again, it's one of those, it's a bit like the, the role-playing thing. It's another one of those moments in game design history, if you like, where it's just that weird thing. Somebody thought, well, Richard Garfield, thought of that idea of collectible card games because card games existed, obviously, and, and mm. there were collectible cards of various types. You know, I used to, I used to collect tea cards. You know, I'm, I'm ticking many geek boxes. But were, um, there, were there games, were there this kind of combat games within a within I, a packet of cards i don't i don't think it's the game itself i think the fact that magic was so strong in generating a community yes. so yes. quickly and that yes. community has persisted and that's what role playing did it it brought people together with a common interest yeah, so magic the gathering as a game is, is is very good but there are games that do things elements of it a lot better I mean, the biggest problem with magic is you can get too much land, you get not enough land, despite how well you build your deck. You can be screwed just by the pure luck of, of the draw. But it's again, it's not about that. It's about <clears throat> 25 years later, you, you have more people than ever. In fact, there's more yeah. people now than there probably has been playing magic up until now, yeah, well, adding it's, together. It's also, it exponentially. it's also instrumental that it came up either at or shortly before. I don't, was it shortly before? Whereas when the internet more or less started, it's... it's, yeah. it's Grew up with that, so it was taking yeah. advantage of all so, that so why, social network. Why then? That, so you were around at the beginning. I was very tangentially around for about five minutes, and frankly, it didn't. It didn't really, didn't really wow me. Magic and living in Cowpat City, I didn't have a lot of people to play with either. But why? You know, we're talking about more the more people than have ever played it in the past playing Magic. That it started a community instantly. Why? What is it about Magic? Is it is it's it the game mechanisms? Is it the stories it tells? I mean, what is it? It's a level of accessibility and the fact that it actually had a, a pretty cheap entry point. You could just buy a deck, and and there you are. You could get straight. It in. had returns as well because some cards were worth a lot more than you originally yeah. paid yes. for them. So yeah. it was it a game that very quickly. Yeah. It had collectible very quickly um, yeah. and the Within game mode. There lots of different types of people could do it. Yeah, I mean, some people would just collect and swap things and make large amounts of money out of stuff. 
other people would do deck design other people would specialize in actually playing so it had it had those different strands of community you don't get that you, you i suppose you get that in role playing in the sense that some people will be dungeon masters or game games masters and other people just are oh, quotes just players and it but in magic the gathering you've got collectors you've got people who are casual players you've got a tournament players you've got you know people who are specializing in specific types of deck design it, it, it's got a multi-stranded community and that's that's yeah, your media, quite rare yeah, your in the game about, that's quite rare in games your point about the media is really important about the internet is really important because the media elements that went with magic the players that was something that suddenly became accessible. Before that, you'd have to buy a magazine. Now you have to find a shop that would sell the magazine in the first place. But with the internet, you could get all the information you needed about it instantly without costing you any money, without having to go anywhere to find it. It came to you. So the community was exponentially growing because of all the websites that would tell you how to build the best decks, yeah. what was coming, the rumor mill, what cards were now suddenly five times the value that you paid for them last week. It became a roller coaster. Now you see the media has been building slowly alongside the board gaming. It sort of started picking up in the mm. mid to late 2000s. But with Magic, it had only been around a year and a half, and suddenly the internet was there. And the Duelist magazine didn't last for much longer, neither did Inquest and the others, because the internet just did everything yeah. that the yeah. print media could do. Uh, <clears throat> it, I think it is that synchronicity of timing. The game itself is, is not that great. It's good fun, well, but it's not that great. But the, the, everything the, else about it is superb. The advantages of it in terms of the internet age, of course, is is the expandability. Uh, the fa it's 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 not one game. It's it's like an ever changing. I don't know a spiral. I don't know. Uh, um, it it just can it can keep growing all the time. Well, which is an advantage and a disadvantage. It's got so, it's it was one of the first ones where you where you could for the company. You could, of course, make shed loads of money on it because it's an ever expanding thing, and you've got a you've got a captive market wow. to an extent. Well, yeah. Well, you end up with a company like Wizards of the Coast, this tiny, tiny independent that were producing, was it White Wolf um, mm -hmm. role playing media? Yeah. A tiny fringe element. Magic came along, and they ended up buying TSR, and then being sold to Hasbro. Yeah. So a company yeah. that started as nothing grew to be something that bought. The very things that it had kind of been following in the coattails of. I mean, to what degree? Story. To what degree is it? So, one thing I was into as a kid was <clears> Panini <throat> sticker albums, right? And I could spend hours and hours. You know, I would issue sweets and pocket money just to buy stickers, uh, and I could sit there for hours and open the stickers and look at them. But of course, there was no game there; it was just sticking them in a book, right? Seeing what you had. To what degree is the booster? The 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 mm. it's the swap element <laughs> in magic it success. It, it, it's yeah, the killer it app. It's off, the killer yeah. app. It yeah. really is. Yeah, definitely the killer yeah. app. I've got, got three of these. Can yeah. I have one of those for three of these? It's a I remember my, rare. my yeah. yeah. Well, Tony, Tony's the one doing the. I wasn't really a collector. Tony was more of the collector and trader type, I guess. Yeah. Well, my friend Rob, God rest him, he couldn't. He was out of work for a long, well, for the longest time, and he couldn't afford magic cards, but he loved playing. I bought him a, a starter set, revised edition, as a birthday present, and um, I vowed that I would get him a black lotus. And mm. I, it took me about eighteen months, but I traded, and somebody actually gave me in a trade a, an international edition black lotus, which is a gold bordered card. Mm. At the time, it was worth nothing. It was worth absolutely nothing at all, and somebody just gave it to me in a trade. So for his next birthday, I gave him this black lotus. And then we would play and he would play his deck and he would have his Black Lotus in it and everything else. It's great. And it was uh, oh, pizza bread, apparently. Yes, I'd love some pizza bread. Thank you. Yes. Oh, um, ooh. Ooh. I'm, the so, talent yeah. I'm the talent here and I'm not being brought food. This is yeah, amazing. well, then, there you go. But yeah, I've, yeah I, I'm thinking about pizza bread now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, and so I, I interviewed Richard Garfield. Oh, Hear right. the clang as the name gets dropped. And, <laughs> you know, he was, I guess the best word, he prevaricated on the whole secondary market thing. And he claimed it was never his intention for there to be a secondary market and all of that sort of stuff. What do you think of the secondary market for magic? Do you think it's <laughs> bloody outrageous? Or, or well, do you think it's fine? Since I sold, no, no, I sold my magic collection, it funded me for the next two Essence purchases mm. of games. 
and some of the travel as well. I think I, I'm, I'm very in favour of the secondary market. <laughs> but yeah, yeah it's, it's no quite... different to, to baseball card. Baseball cards are, the, are probably the biggest <laughs> thing. They've been hugely valuable for the longest time. Um, and if people want to spend $250,000 on one card that they'll never take out, they'll never handle it, they'll never play it in a deck, well, it's an investment opportunity. It becomes investment after a certain point of view. So, you know, it's whatever, so I just, it's whatever it is. I just want to say to anyone watching this before we go on, if you have any questions for Alan and Tony that you want to put to them and nothing is too indecent, <clears throat> then uh, hold them till the end and then we'll have a sort of five, ten minute Q&A sesh and they can tell you all the deepest, darkest secrets of their soul. So, so you know, you're into magic at this time. What is the British magic scene like at this time? How many Terrible. people are playing? Is it is it huge? <laughs> is it full? Is it Awful. replete with objectionable no. people? Yes, it is. It's, it was yes. appalling. Yes. Absolutely risible. I mean, there are some terrible, terrible people in it. There were some That's terrible chances. There were, very good people too. there were scroungers. There was a guy that was prey on you. On, there was a guy in our club in, in Cheltenham who would try and do swaps. We all had little printouts of, of revised edition lists, so we would tick them all off because we all desperately wanted to get all 360 cards or whatever it was. And he would go around going, do you want, I've got some uh, Armageddon clocks and some ebony horses for trade. Has anybody got any dual lands that they don't want? And he would trade us all this shit for... <laughs> Because we wanted them for our sets for all the spare dual lands that we have. And a dual land is like a thousand dollars. Yeah. But he was, even back then he realized that these were valuable cards and he was preying on the on the noobs. But Alan and I used to meet up at a, there were a couple of pubs where we used to meet up to do trading and play our decks and we tried playing for Anti a couple of times, it never really worked out. But no, more I, often I, than I, we started I, I playing them. We started meeting to play other games. We were mm. playing um stuff that mark was thinking about or we played i mean we played middle earth the, the tcg as well didn't we around at mark's place one yes, time yes we did yeah yeah and we played right, black yeah. overcoat game and we started doing things that weren't magic and that's when alan and i realized i i realized that he had a history in actually board game publishing because he hasn't mentioned yeah. it up to now he mentioned playing games he hasn't mentioned that he had a minor yeah. career in the 80s actually publishing it so so let's let's go to that then what so you published games in the 80s. What were they? What was your success rate like? What kind of money did you make? And what did you learn about the industry at that time? Right. Okay. Uh, the first game I the first game I ever um designed that was anything like publishable was a game called City of Sorcerers, which was a fancy board game. Um and um it, that was my it was I that was in the days when you had to do it on a BBC micro and um it was all like oh it's horrendous. Changing things is just really difficult before we've got proper DTP and, and word word processing and stuff. Um and I designed this game and I thought, well, Lou, Lou's been published, why can't I get published? So I so I, I hawked this around. Well, actually, I, I sent a copy to a, a little known publisher called games workshop um and a couple of a couple of guys called ian livingston and steve jackson um l looked at it and and i'm proudly the possessor of a rejection from um from games workshop <laughs> quite properly to be honest because it, it it wasn't that great um but i um so i didn't i didn't make it with games workshop at that stage now mind you i think at that point they'd only published four games the, their first four do you remember those warlock and and um uh what was it oh god valley of the four winds things like that well i've just um, i've just fixed up an appointment to have ian livingston on my show so oh, that will yeah. all become clear at some <laughs> point in the future um so god. i i went to some other uk-based companies of which there were about three i think at the time probably and a, a, a little known company called standard games and publications actually was looking for stuff to publish now that was i subsequently found out that was that was probably largely uh, because they were a, basically a printing company rather than a games publishing company, um, and they were really looking for things that they could print. It didn't much, match, uh, much matter what they were printing, to be honest. Um, and so they, they accepted my Game City Sorcerers, and that was that was uh, published. Um, uh, it was illustrated by, a, a, again, a little-known guy called Gary Chalk, um, who eventually became a director of standard games and publications um so uh we worked on that and then 
that that game came out in 83 and plummeted to the bottom rapidly. And I think we sold a few hundred copies. But actually, since they were a printing company, their the actual production costs are really low and um they weren't that worried. But they had a <clears throat> they had a series of games which they'd started to publish, which was a which was the Cry Havoc series, which was a medieval skirmish game. Um and <laughs> rather interestingly standard games of publications had already advertised that they were going to do the second version of second um game in the series um and it was going to be called siege and it was going to be published in about nine months time and they hadn't actually got any form of design at all for it well i, mean, I think gary had dabbled with with some pictures but then you know, gary's an illustrator not actually really wasn't really a game designer at that point and since i had a history and war studies background from my university time and i was game designing and i'd done some war game some amateur war game design um i designed a game called siege um and that was done like i say it was done in nine months flat so it was very focused very concentrated and that is still my number one selling game which it sold significantly large numbers for the time particularly for a UK game. So, um, and, and this is why you're a multimillionaire now. Then. This is exactly why I am, I'm living the life of a luxury billionaire in my yacht <clears throat> in War Boys. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, at the time, it, I mean, I look back at some of the records, it, it was probably a few, <laughs> a few thousand pounds which back in the mists of time was actually quite a lot of money, but it was it was nothing like. I mean, it's a lot of money for me now. I you mean, frankly, like... ten quid's a lot of money for me now. <laughs> you couldn't you couldn't live on the amount of money I was getting uh, for that. And I also um, designed a couple of other games for uh, standard games, but we had a rather large falling out, largely because um, I think they're all. I think I think none of them are around now. So they were. A, <laughs> Shall we say possibly not entirely um, legitimate in some of their dealings, um, and they, for, for example, we had we had a contract. We did have proper contracts, which is it's quite radical, but they weren't paying me any royalties. Mm. Now, I, I having since my sister is an accountant, I was able to get an accountant in there, and it turned out that it it, it was largely through sheer incompetence uh, that I wasn't getting any royalties, and eventually I did get paid. So that was good. But they never told one thing they never told me, which is I found out several years later, they'd licensed the game to a French company. And there was about 20,000 copies of the game being printed in French, which I never got anything for at all. So I learned a lot about the industry, but through a particular lens, if you like. Um, the lens so that's are being why, ripped off. The lens are being ripped off, really. But that's why, it, that's why I, uh, nowadays I would, I want a long term relationship with companies and other people rather than gosh short so um, anyway so anyway, that's I, all, yes that was all great fun so i picture a crowded nightclub smoke thumping music and two gentlemen stood at the opposite sides of the dance floor and their eyes meet fleetingly and they come together during the chorus of too shy by kajagoogoo and from then on, a 20-year relationship is born. But how did you two actually meet? Well, I think we met at the Magic the Gathering Club. Think, yeah, that's we? it. Yeah, yeah next question. <laughs> I, I painted this beautiful picture of 1980s success. And this is what well, we, we met. We met across a crowded pub with, with hands with full of trading cards. Yeah, but it, yeah, it was, what happened is that Alan and I both decided that being permanent employees was too much of a pain in the ass and not getting us enough cash. So we both decided to become in, you know, sort of self-employed contractors at roughly the same time. Yeah, and um, because I knew Alan, and I knew Alan had a sister who was an accountant. I got Alan's sister was my accountant for my IT business, and so we basically left the safety and comfort of, of permanent employ to become uh, <laughs> contractors. And that gave us a little bit more money than we were expecting. Certainly, from my perspective, after my first proper contract, I was quitting. I was like, what the hell am I supposed to do with all this money? Because I was still paying myself what I earned at the civil service. Hmm. And there was all this extra money sloshing around. And, I, and given that Alan and I had been talking about games and, you know, <clears throat> and producing games and designing games, we decided that it'd be quite fun if we produced the game. And so yeah. we yeah. talked about the stuff that we were working on at the time. 
And copper total was, was 50, 54 cards. You know, it should be straightforward, easy to make. Yeah. Um, why not? Why not do something with that? Oh, how and do I was, so, so yeah. before I mean, we get there, where were you, Tony, design-wise at this point? So Alan, Alan's a veteran of the industry. <laughs> I had where a notebook. You? I had a notebook full of stuff, and I had a couple of prototypes. I had uh, um, the fast food stuff, the the food fight <laughs> game. I had a uh, black black overcoat game in various forms, including one that was rejected by. Roger Hayworth at Gibson Games, but it did come along a, a long way working with Roger. And I had Ecology, which would become either. And I had a few things. I had notebooks, basically, and a few prototypes. But Copper Toddle was probably the one that was the most um, advanced. And at work, I had access to a photocopier and a printer that never ran out of ink. So that was really good for knocking together the prototype. To be fair, I think the key thing here on Copper Toddle was not just that Tony had this game which he'd been designing, but it had been in, it had been play tested he'd been, he'd been playing it with people at work or whatever in lunch times and things yeah. like that it had been played a lot so it was actually it wasn't a new thing which was suddenly here's this here's this weird new well it was new obviously and it was weird but it, it had been played a lot so it was relatively mature it, it worked i mean i think but what uh, made I, you two decide what was it about <clears throat> your relationship that made you decide we'll start a company together well we both wanted to design we both wanted to design games and um we were we were both well neither of us knew what we were doing did we really and we didn't know what we we're doing in terms of how to get games published properly i mean i i got games published through standard games but that wasn't as you can know from what i said earlier it's not a happy thing so i and and since then we've been playing magic the gathering my standard games and publications was in the late 80s and we were doing magic for ages after that so it's like 10 years later was it i think when did we when did we publish? Copper Troll came out in 1999. was Surprise Dare Foundation. So it was it was like yeah, it was like five or ten years yeah. or so later. Um, so so none of us knew neither of us knew anything much about the current state of play in in board games. And I I, I way back when I was doing the um the Sunday game stuff, I used to go to the Earl's Court Toy and Games Fair, but I hadn't been there for like 10 years. So I, I knew nothing really about the the new industry, and I, I didn't know much. I, I I knew that there were these other board games coming out of Germany, but I didn't know much about how to get into that. Mm -hmm. But that seemed like the right route to go, um, and for that, I figured we needed to have some method that we could pool our resources, mm -hmm. and uh, um, having a company seemed like the best way. I mean, I, I, oh, I I'd previously had a solo company called Griffin Games. Which I published one game with in the in the late eighties called Starship Tycoons, um, and that was my one previous uh, uh, solo effort at production. And I learned a lot on the grounds that when you cock things up, you learn a hell of a lot. So um, I managed to make all the mistakes that I possibly could in one game, and so that was quite enlightening. And, and so, um, so by the time we got to Surprise Tech Games and talking about that. Um, I had a background in publication, so I knew how to I knew how to get print made because I was doing that through my real employment, uh, and we both were doing game design. So, uh, and so I got two questions. So, firstly, surprise stare. Where does the name come from? Why did you decide on that? And secondly, what was the original conception, the original brief for the company, or did you not have one? Did you just sort of go, "Oh, we'll do this, and it'll be great." Well, we were going to uh, design games for other companies. It was 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 our original thought. We thought we'd do Copper Toddle to because it was straightforward to do. It's a card game, comes in a box, you need some artwork, and that's it. It should be straightforward to produce, no complicated components. <coughs> yeah. um, and we thought we would do is we go and show this, we'll sell that. And what we'll do is we'll use the opportunity. I'd never heard of Essen, so we found out about that and we went to Essen. And the idea was that we would actually design for other people. We would design for corporate stuff. Yeah. We would design for other games companies. You know, it'd be easy. You know, it'd be fine. Because when we first went to Essen in 2001, I think it was, I think there were maybe 350 exhibitors. I think that was it. 300 to 350. It wasn't a huge number of exhibitors. And bearing in mind that a third of those weren't board games at all. They were comics and mm. uh, medieval armor and LARPing mm. stuff and mead brewers and, and quite a lot of Magic the Gathering stalls as well in Hall 6 at the time. Halls five and nine tended to be the indies. Halls four, five, and nine. Yeah. So in those halls, you could probably get about a hundred stands in total. 
Um, so yeah, that was the idea. And then we very quickly were disavowed of that notion because everyone was saying, well, no, we don't, we don't want to publish this and yeah. we haven't got any space for that. And we're, we're, we've got designs for the next three years. <laughs> yeah. Um, there were very, very few publishing slots and mm. there was, there, it was mainly a German based industry. I mean, there were hardly any UK uh, designers like us starting out. So it was very difficult to, to, well, even yeah. though we met Martin Wallace before Age of Steam came out. I mean, yeah. I remember him and John Bora and me sharing, you know, me and John Bora certainly were bumming fags off each other at Nuremberg in about 2001, um, sort of smoking and chewing the fat about board games. And John had just sold Trans America, I think, to winning moves and was complaining he had so much money sloshing around. He had to, he had to spend it, otherwise the US tax would have it all. So he was for literally flying around the world to take his designers, the Winston game guys, out for lunch and supper because he had to get rid of the money. It was it was it was a ridiculous licensing deal that he got because Trans Trans America sold a bucket load, didn't it, Alan? It was yeah, like yeah. million, oh, yeah. million dollars. Oh yeah, um, corking little game. Um, we 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 wore out one copy and had to buy another one. Yeah. <laughs> so back in those days, you could you know there there weren't that many people to speak to. You know Martin and Warfrog and all those all the pals that did their uh, hammy and. Jeff and all those guys, Chris Dearlove, all, all, the, all the usual crew. It's quite a closed shop. You know, we were there as the British and it was really difficult to get in with, with anybody else, really. I mean, there weren't many others. There were the Brits, the Germans, maybe a couple of French companies there. Yeah, yeah. It was quite small, wasn't it? It was, it was, quite, it was quite small, yeah. And we, um, I mean, we, we didn't really talk about the founding of the company. That was, we founded it as a limited company. Hmm. Um, because that seemed where to go, and we because my sister is an accountant, she could advise us on that. And we, that so that was very straightforward. We didn't spend a huge amount of money, but we invested quite a lot in in the games production. And really, with Copper Twaddle, uh, with Copper Twaddle, we were aiming at uh, kind of showcasing what we could do. I think that was the main purpose of uh, of Copper Twaddle. Um, so we went to town a bit on the print, so that the the their cards were very high quality card stock. Um, so that we, we had we had we had copies of Copper Twaddle that were played throughout the whole of Essen, and by the end of the Essen, they were still easily playable. They weren't they weren't flimsy stuff. Um, and I think from that point of view, it it kind of worked. Um, but we weren't really at that stage. We weren't really commercial. And, and so before we go on to before we go on to the Q&A, tomorrow we'll come back to the, the building of the company. But mm. one last question. How surprised would our, would the Alan and Tony of 20 years ago have been to realise that the company would still be going in, in 2020? Ooh. We'd be really surprised, I think, because we... We, I was always worried, personally, I was always worried that we would end up like a couple of the companies that we first sort of boothed together with at Essen. So you would often find yourself year on year opposite or next to the same companies. Yeah. And quietly, we would start seeing certain companies just not come back again. Just, yeah, yeah. And we were very keen on making sure that anything we did well with, any money, we would plow into the next project. So at least it would keep the company going. And, but it was very much we had to keep it going ourselves. So we paid for our own accommodation. We paid for our own travel expenses. <clears throat> um, it couldn't even afford to pay for the booths, you know, surprise there as itself. We just wanted to keep it going to, just to keep it going really, to make, to, to give ourselves space. And um, as you'll find out over the next few sessions, we had a couple of moments where it could have all gone awfully, awfully wrong. Um, but it, yeah, we were actually growing at the same time as the as the industry was growing and it was opening up. And so we sort of rode that wave. And I think we were quite prudent, actually. We didn't overstretch ourselves. Um, but yeah, what we, do you think? We never, for example, yeah, I agree. I agree. For, for example, we never we never considered like, well, not seriously anyway. I think we might have dreamed of it. Never considered like ditching our day jobs and actually just going full time in the company. Because I think we had a bit of real, we've, we've seen we'd seen other people do that and come a cropper so we felt and especially we both got we both had young families um or at least tony had a young family we had the family um so you know uh, we didn't want to take unnecessary risks i think that was it and we wanted to use it as a vehicle for for our game designs that was the, the basic thing was 
we wanted a vehicle for our game designs. We weren't looking at it as, oh, we can make vast amounts of money by publishing games per se, although I think we always dreamed of that, didn't we, Tony? <laughs> we dreamed that we might suddenly make a huge amount I think, of money. I, that, that's well, late, no, late. I think our, our first goal was to sell a game to somebody else. Mm, I yeah, think that was yeah. the idea. If we could actually get another company to spend their money producing a game that one of us had designed, that for us would, would be really, really great. That would be an achievement unlocked. Yeah. Because ultimately, if you're, if you're working in a good industry, and we would just come through the year 2000, IT situation, which is very lucrative for a lot of IT consultants. Um, it's very easy to produce a game if you've got the money to produce it. It's less easy to make any money back off it, but yeah. you can say, oh, I'm a board game publisher just by throwing endless wads of cash at it. <clears throat> but if somebody else comes along and says, no, actually, I think that's good enough for me to spend my money on it, yeah. that is something very valuable indeed. And that's what I think we were really hoping for. Whether it's somebody would just buy the design and print it, or we would do something and then somebody would license subsequent prints yes, from us. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, hopefully, there are people watching, there are people chatting, and to save my blushes for the last sort of five minutes or so, does anybody in the chat have any questions for these two illustrious doyens of British game design? I'm just looking through the chat for any questions here. <laughs> hmm. Well, everyone's saying hello to each other, which is really good. Yeah, it's good, yeah. Not listening to us, but just saying hello to each other, <coughs> which, is, which is rather lovely. See, we can build a community too. <laughs> <laughs> any any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Why uh, why would we be listening to you, says, says thanks, David. Thanks, thanks David. That's okay, good. Alan, you answer that question. But why, would, why would David be listening to you? I don't think he ever does, does he? Masochistic. Lisa, I, don't, I don't think... Deeply, key, deeply key, masochistic. The market wouldn't exist without Surprise Stare. If it hadn't well, been for yeah. Book of Days being demoed we, to Richard well, Breeze at think, the Surprise think, Stare. We have, a we have a track record of helping other UK designers to learn from our mistakes and, and, and thereby make their own separate individual mistakes rather than the ones that we've already made. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's what we... Um, and, and so, so Bears has got a question. What would incite violence in Alan <laughs> or Tony? Parking, I've seen Tony <laughs> a particular issue with. I'm not quite sure. Alan's been very moderate over the years. He's survived a lot of nonsense from me. Um, I'm a pacifist at heart. I think ultimately we, we, both, we both value what surprise there. <clears throat> how surprise there works it's very much um everybody's done a bit of everything through the years you know we have our unsung heroes we have charlie who did all the art and, and production layout stuff before we started hyperloying you know the, mixing with the clemens francis of the world charlie did all of that stuff for us vicky got her first bits of illustration work for yeah. billy she did the box art and then yes. she went on to do the wonderful work for tatamo and uh, I think we're very good at, we have been very fair in our division of labor. We've all got together in the same room and physically packed games from boxes and boxes, yes. separate components. And none of us is really, I mean, I, I lauded about the place. I have a great fun being Mr. Tony Boydell, the board game designer, but you know, none, none of, nothing that, none of what I would do at Essen would oh. be possible without Alan actually organizing the fucking hotels, I think, organizing I think the food. I think the one thing that nearly, nearly got me to violence uh, was an offhand co comment by someone who said, are you still working for Tony? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> and, and I nearly hit that person, but I didn't. <laughs> That's terrible because I, um, make it, I try and make it, whenever I've spoken to anybody over the last 10 years about anything, I've always been very clear and conscious to make oh, sure yeah, everybody yes. understands. Surprise stare is me and Alan and Charlie. Oh, yes. we, and it's, it's, it, it, it is a bit rankling sometimes because I'm the mousy one. You know, Alan is, Alan is, is, the, is the feet under the swan. He's the swan's feet, yeah? Mm. I can sit there looking all calm and serene on the surface, but he's the one that's doing all the bloody paddling. But we'll do... Oh. We, there's a whole swathe of stuff we can do later in a later show on why that kind of thing uh came about which is which is fine and you know 
there's yeah, that's that's that that rankled quite a lot. So, as so Charlie, as Charlie would no doubt say. <laughs> so this is a question I asked, and you didn't answer. <laughs> but Tabby Sun Lion has reminded where does the name Surprise Stare come from? Ah, oh, the, oh, the, yeah, that hmm. I think that came out of some dark, deep corner of Tony's brain, actually. I think I, I just did a cartoon of somebody yes, looking surprised. That's and I right. Be, what you want is a yeah. games company that you know you'll be surprised at what they do, and we sort of thought the idea would uh, would be good to have a variety of products. There we got the right, sur there. there's other our, than being yeah, yeah, thingy. So you could be a games company that that did nothing but railway games. But we wanted to be a game where you would think I'm going <clears> to see what they've got at Essen this year, but we have no idea yeah. what it is they're going to have. You know, so last year they did a game about medieval, whatever it is. And this year they're doing one about, what, family inheritance. And next year they're doing one about Celtic kings. You know, so we like the idea that our games would be not not, not the usual thing. Yes. Something that yeah, we've got no, we haven't got a track record of, of, of any form of branding really um so i mean our games range from you know bloody legacy which is a kind of very yeah. short card very nice. throwaway card game up to confucius which is hey, a, a medium heavy euro i've even got we've even got a um, set of miniatures rules which we've done under the surprise Day games um label so i mean yeah we we tend to design what we like um and yeah. we're not in that sense we're not commercial we're not we're not brand well we are it's brand but we're not a we don't restrict ourselves by our, by our branding. Although, to be fair, now we've got the Pocket Campaign series. That is, that's more of a conventional branding idea. So, Rug Six, your <laughs> questions will be answered over the over the subsequent few days, and I'm sure we'll wrap that up on the final day. That seems like a final day question. And also with Giles, Benef oh, yeah. Giles Bennett, that also seems like a final day question. And and so I guess that uh, no one else has a question. So we'll say thank you ever so much for everyone watching. I hope yes, thank you. that I haven't pushed my way in front of incredibly interesting answers. And we'll see you half an hour later than yeah. today, tomorrow. And yep. we'll go over the nascent <laughs> bubblings of surprise stare games. Lovely. How to get hold of Tony is below there. If you need to get hold of Tony, um, if you don't, if you don't, I don't owe book. anybody any money as far as I know. So <laughs> if you don't read, we'll his try blog, that one. If, and, if you uh, don't read, his, if you don't read his blog, that's probably a good thing. Um, but you know, <laughs> and I'll try. I'll try and get my my website onto the ticker tomorrow. Yes, please. That would be great. And mine mine is here. Alan Port Surprise Against mainly email for me, and I have a a blog. But now I'm not a daily blogger. Uh, great. Thanks very much to everybody. Thanks to Ben for sharing yeah. us, which has been which has been great. Yeah. And so Alan, Tony, thank you very much. Bye.